streaming live around the world, this is Paper Cuts with Brad and Jay. I'm the one you love. I'm Jay. Thanks so much for stopping by. Over there's Brad. It's his show. It's his show. That's why I'm the host, and we just love Jay. Now you know it's all natural. I mean, you know, nothing's rehearsed, right? No, absolutely nothing is rehearsed on this show. God, you just suck the life out of me. It just feels like <laughs> you've fire. got you've got a lot grayer since we started this. I I'll have. I know. I have. Tonight. Oh, he's a bad mother. Shut your mouth. I'm just talking about Todd Keesling. We are live. We are called Paper Cuts? Who came up? Remember that, that old best intro, intro ever? <laughs> <laughs> Brad, do you remember the old ones? The We're called Paper Cuts? Who came up with that yeah. name? Or, like no, the, the, one, the, fir- the first one was the whole snapping thing you put together. Oh, yeah. you What's up, everyone? <laughs> Welcome to the show. That's Bradford over there. I'm Jay. We uh, have this little show. It's the greatest show in the world of all shows. The history of all shows. It's the greatest. Think of the greatest show you ever watch, and then we're above that. Enough about us. <laughs> this evening we have someone who's no stranger to the show because he stalks us. Author of Devil's Creek, which everyone in the world has, correct? Brad, it's not yeah. they should. Hey, hold it up there for us. Cause I I did not prepare for this. I could have grabbed it from the shelf, but I figured Brad would have it. I didn't even I prepare know. for this. So. Yeah, I, yeah, it, it's all cool. Uh, scan lines you may have, the fun or reconciliation you may have. I could go on and on, but you know this is only a couple hours, and I have to go to work on Monday. He's back with a brand new collection, Cold, Black, and Infinite. Welcome oh, to yeah. show, everyone. Todd Keesling. Hello, sir. Hello. Thanks for having on, me, Todd. guys. Hello, everybody watching. Thank you for tuning in. See, there's people to chat. You were afraid no one's going to show up for this. It's a Friday night, you know. So uh, I yes, don't know. It's first of all, it's us. I would say it's it's us. So he's he's trepidatious and no one's going to show up. Yeah, <laughs> but since you're here, people are showing up. So they're here for Todd, not That's not it. for us. Hey, Cat. Hey, Nikki's hey, here. Nikki. Nikki's here for Todd. Speaking of Friday night, Todd, what, what are you normally doing besides talking to two bozos with microphones here? So if it's not a Patreon movie night, because uh, I do a movie night once a month for my patrons, um, if it's not that, I'm usually I'm usually relaxing because I, you know, I I do most of my work throughout the week, so I try to I try to take weekends off if I can. Mm-hmm. Um, so for but Friday nights I'm usually like relaxing in my living room with uh with my wife Erica and like tonight for example I'd either be watching a fi- a, a movie a horror film uh or I'd be playing a game uh Starfield most likely. <laughs> so before we get too far into this tell me how does it feel to have weekends off to be able to relax. <laughs> I mean, I'm not at work on the weekends, but I'm at work on the weekends. So like I go to work during the week to get a vacation from the weekends. So tell me, how does that feel? Jay, we were talking <laughs> before we went live about your about your job and everything. And, you know, how about rather than I tell you about what it's like having weekends, what if I tell you what it's like not having a boss? <laughs> Even better, right? <laughs> Just to make you feel a little bit worse. Yeah. <laughs> Jay or, or in my in my situation, uh, several bosses that are never on the same page. So, well, <laughs> oh, we just got a little personal. Okay. No one knows I do this show. So, okay. <laughs> Your management will pull you in on Monday. Oh, so I we've know. seen this show called Paper Cuts, Jay. And, um, <laughs> yeah. But well, I see. Old. I, I've got the comments open on the sidebar here. So, William, thank you for coming. Becky, yay. I hope you're feeling better. That's my agent. Oh, nice. Yeah. And I so, think uh, I think that's Kevin, a cemetery dance. I could be wrong. But Kevin, if that's you, rock on, brother. I think it's probably Kevin. So last time you were on the show, we did the re-release party for Devil's Creek. Yeah, and then subsequently throughout the summer, you went on a tour for that, the Summer of Dread tour. So how did how did your book tour go over the summer? Uh, it went incredibly well, um, especially the the last leg uh, in Kentucky. It was 
exhausting. It was expensive as fuck. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you know what? It was great getting out and doing event like actual like one on one events with you know the public as opposed to just cons and stuff. And mm -hmm. I didn't get to do that for Devil's Creek when it originally released because uh, of COVID. So it was great to to get out and see see the fans, see readers, and meet meet new ones uh, who were mm -hmm. just picking up my book on the off chance that they might like it. And I, I think a few of them did. One of them did not. <laughs> <laughs> they, they let you know about it already? Uh, yeah, they hit Goodreads pretty quick. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so what did the tour consist of? Multiple cities, bookstores? Uh, uh, it was pretty much focused on the east coast i went as far north as massachusetts and as far south as kentucky it started with uh a barnes and noble appearance for devil's creek and barnes and noble uh group events we did a group event um at steel city brewery in phoenixville pa me and uh, other members of the pa chapter of the hwa Stoker Con, uh, Nikon, Author Con. Hey, Chad, thanks for thanks for showing up, dude. Appreciate it. Um, you know, it, it it's kind of a blur at this point. Um, <laughs> honestly, it, it's this summer went by so fast. Like, mm -hmm. I can't believe it's you know we're almost into October now, and mm -hmm. I feel like everything was over in in a blink uh just from so much travel uh for for me anyway um you know we we tend to drive everywhere within a reasonable distance so yeah yeah horror on maine which was the first year for that con um yeah I, i'm i'm drawing a blank on everything else brad you showed up to uh one of the yeah, he yeah, came so down the to uh, the, the tailless yeah. dog. Yeah. So, um, so how's it feel to have groupies? <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll follow Todd anywhere. <laughs> I wouldn't call them groupies. I call them heathens. Well, heathens. You yeah. have one. Heathens. I mean, Brad was the groupie. He had the. Uh, I think he called. Yeah, you signed it right in here. <laughs> Fellow heathens, I think, somewhere. Yeah, get thee to church. Yeah. It's one of my canned si sayings for books. <laughs> So I know I know you've done cons and stuff in the past, but this is your like actual first book tour that just wasn't strictly going to like a specific con. Uh, wasn't my first book tour ever. I did a small okay. tour back in 2012 when my second novel was released. Okay, um, it's one of the monochrome books which nobody ever read. So, <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, it had been a while, and I was long overdue. Nice. I'm. I'm glad that you, we talked about it a little bit while you know i was down there in Berea, but you said it was pretty good turnout most of those places and everything which i think that's really cool i feel like yeah for me i'd be i'd be nervous if i was the author like worried no one would show up all the time. uh i mean that's always a real it's always a real um concern i mean mm -hmm. you're you're fighting against people's schedules which you have no way of knowing you're fighting against the the elements if it's raining people are not going to go out um, had, you know, if it's a weekend or a date that coincides with something else that's important socially, like, uh, I had a signing at the beginning of the summer that happened to fall on the day of prom. Oh yeah. So, yeah. you know, there, there weren't a lot, it wasn't a lot of foot traffic, but, uh, you know, for the most part, it, it was surprising. I didn't expect the kind of turnout that I got. Mm-hmm. I'm also, you know, just a pessimist that way. I don't expect much, <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I butcher cabin books in Louisville was a good turnout for that. Um, that's Tailless a, that's Dog. a cool little store. Yeah, it is. Um, had a great turnout at, uh, at the Barnes and Noble in Lexington, which I didn't expect. Um, mm. and, uh, yeah. Yeah, it was just uh, beyond my expectations. We'll put it that now, way. Are, are these uh, the stores you went to, do they have your books 
on the shelves or did you uh, re they rearrange that like ahead of time maybe they'll so they could get some advertising and some promotion for you um they had book they had my books there like i didn't take my books they provided them um and i signed stock of what was left after each event okay so uh, Barnes and Noble in Lexington, Tailless Dog in Berea, Butcher Cabin in Louisville, uh, Conquest Books and Coffee in Ashland, Kentucky. They, I believe, have signed copies still. Um, at least, uh, I think Conquest did. They're they're running low, but I don't know. Um, I mean, you're talking about something that was over a month ago. Yeah. So I, I hope that they've sold out and they've ordered more, yeah. <laughs> uh, but you never know. <laughs> I remember you telling me that you were surprised at the, the Barnes and Noble turnout. Like, I guess you weren't expecting as many Barnes people. and Nobles are always, they're always a crap shoot. You know, it's like you yeah. either I've done Barnes and Nobles where they just kind of put you in a corner and give you a stack of your books <laughs> And what what they have is what they have. They don't have any extras for you if you if you do sell out, uh -huh. and you know they're just kind of like they don't want to be bothered. And then you do Barnes and Nobles like the one in Wilkesbury or Libby Place in, in Richmond or the one in Lexington. They were gung ho. They like were all about it. They checked on us. They put us right up front. You know where people walked in. Mm -hmm. Um. You know, I had nothing bad to say about it. It was a great, it was a great placement. They had, they were enthusiastic about having me there. I was their first event since COVID, which was nuts. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, so like they have a lot of competition with, uh, an indie bookseller there in Lexington, uh, Joseph Beth and yeah. Joseph Beth was my first choice. Uh, but, for reasons beyond me, we couldn't get, we couldn't get something arranged there in time. So mm -hmm. uh, maybe in the future, but um, you know, Barnes and Noble was great to, was, you know, eager to have me and it went great. So overall you had a pretty good experience for the tour. Yeah. 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 Get, yeah. It, get in the future to get spreading the word about your work and all. Yeah. But, yeah. It's like, I'll definitely do a tour again, but, you know, I need to sleep a lot first. <laughs> I'm glad it that was. That Bards, go ahead. I'm, gl I'm glad that Barnes and Noble treated you well, especially the one in Lexington, because their horror section is not that big. So I'm glad that they treated a horror author. But you know what? They, for what they have there, uh, they have a, a decent selection, and they actually had uh, Mallerman's new one, Spin of Black Yarn, on the oh, shelf yeah. before it was released. <laughs> So there you go. Get your early yeah. copies. At yeah, yeah. Go to that Barnes and Noble because they don't care about street dates. <laughs> <laughs> that that's actually on their sign outside. Wouldn't we don't care, care about street, street dates. dates. Yeah, yeah. That's that's the Barnes and Noble I go to is the one in Lexington. So, so I would ask would, them about is their this secret up, stock? <laughs> is this something you you would suggest to uh, up and coming authors, writers? Uh, you know, trying to get the word out for their books if they're able to do a little tour like this. You know, or, or is this something that you you want somebody that's got a few years under their belt before they go out and do something? Like uh, that? I mean, I'll give my advice, but I'm not a guru on it. You know, I a person better to talk about that, I think, would be Philip Fricazzi because he just wrapped up like a 20 or 30 <laughs> date tour. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he went to the UK, too. Yeah, he's over really? there right now, I think, um, you know. Brian King would be another one to ask uh, about that. Just, you know, he's done multiple tours. Um, but for me, it, it if I were just starting out, I would, you know, keep it small. Mm -hmm. uh, try to, if you're driving and having to travel, like, and stay somewhere overnight, you know, try to be as frugal as you can because it does add up. Right. Mm -hmm. Um so yeah plan plan ahead uh whenever you're thinking about doing the tour start planning it like at least six months in advance mm -hmm. if not longer um you know that i really only started firming things up with folks around march of this year and in hindsight mm -hmm. i should have started last summer 
just it really depends on how much how much you want to do right you know how far you want to go uh you know try to find try to find bookstores that will stock your book and also try to find bookstores that are receptive to horror because some aren't right. some are not at all and uh you know always start with the indies i would focus on indies honestly and then you know sprinkle in the big box stores here and there yeah. i mean i i don't want to you know spend a whole show on that but i'm just curious about it like when you were setting this up and you you were contacting or you had some people contact these these uh certain stores were there any that were like todd who we, we don't do this we don't we don't you know you have to give names but like you know we, we don't have authors come in and were there any, any kind of pushback any trouble getting in a lot of these places i mean usually in cases like that you just don't get a response okay um but you want to go somewhere that at least like caters to the horror fans you know right. you don't you're not going to see me selling devil's creek in a christian bookstore for example well, that would be awesome if <laughs> it would be did. awesome uh but you know it's a religious book about redemption uh, <laughs> we could probably find a way to spin that just just <laughs> fyi i mean we could probably Todd walks in the somewhere. doors and burst into flames <laughs> <laughs> give a look every every time somebody you know pays to get one sign give them a little bottle of holy water and just watch it, everything burn <laughs> just, oh i'm thinking of something now go it ahead evaporates <laughs> To Jay, thanks for buying my book. Jesus died for nothing. Sincerely, Todd <laughs> Uh Man, now you want to make sure that they have, you know, they do have the foot traffic to support something like that. So you got to do a little bit of homework if it's a place you're not familiar with. Mm -hmm. um, but what was the other part of your question i, I don't you. remember to be honest with you but... <laughs> he was no, I'm so... asking if the bookstores were receptive for the most oh part. right yeah, like yeah like, when you reached out to him i mean did you get any kind of like and eh, we don't he, do that or he's just trying kinda... to stir up controversies what he's trying to do to i'm him. not I, I'm, I, I'm, I don't want to spend the whole show on this i'm just curious on how one would set up a tour like this and uh it's, it's I mean, educational for people listening and watching brad okay okay try to i mean there are two ones. two published writers on this show right now just Shut fyi <laughs> to uh you try to hit try to look up bookstores that are that are open to horror authors right. and you know the, i think the there wasn't like pushback per se but it was just like trying they were trying to set expectations like we're a small store mm -hmm. we you know don't we don't do a lot of events, but we're happy to have you. Right, right. And so in cases like that, I definitely tried to get the word out and promote it. And I sent them some promotional material for their shop and everything to help, you know, facilitate that foot traffic that they're worried isn't going to show up because, mm -hmm. you know, in, realistically how one event goes may determine whether or not they do more That's and true. so you want to make you know you, you want to try to do your part to help them ensure that that foot traffic is there yeah so yeah any other controversy you'd like to stir <laughs> yeah. I, I do want to ask about the the tailless dog one because they had a few um like local artists there that did like horror inspired stuff. Did you help yeah. set that up or was that the store that brought? So up? they had, it was just a uh, luck. I think that I contacted okay. them when I did, they had a number of horror artists mm -hmm. that had been, had approached them about doing an event. And when I got in touch, that was kind of the, I guess the, what finally got them to move on it. Okay. So they could have a bunch of people at one time. And, uh, you know, I asked, I asked Laurel to, uh, partner with me on that event. And when I do a tour again, I think I'll do more of that, you know, kind of, you see, you see like Rob Atone doing it. You see, uh, Eric Loraka doing it for Kazi, especially, I think it's all he did on all, every date. He had another author there with him mm, to kind of yeah. have a discussion, uh, rather than it just be, you know, a reading and them sitting at a table the entire time right i think that's a really good uh that's a really good tactic 
honestly. Mm -hmm. And it also kind of takes some of the pressure off your shoulders. Yeah, it, it sounds like it will. Like you have somebody to bounce things off of to just get things moving some and getting a discussion open. That's yeah. Cool. Yeah. And maybe you bring the other author's fans in too. Maybe. Yeah, maybe exactly. You, you, you get, get this. Fans in there. You, d you get this cross pollination a little bit, mm -hmm. uh, which is always good. Yeah. Laurel agrees. Definitely nicer to have two. <laughs> Thanks again, Laurel. It was a cool little vid down there. I'd, I'd, I'd go back again if they did something. Yeah. Like, yeah. It was a nice little again. shot. Mm -hmm. So we'll move on from, from the devil's Creek and the, the summer of dread tour, which by the way, that's a cool title for your book tour. The Thank summer you. Of dread. Thank you. You've got this, this nice little sweet nugget coming out. Was it, is it next Tuesday? This it's, coming Tuesday? Coming yes. Out? It's coming Tuesday, four days. Nice. Yeah. So how long have you been working on, on this book? Cold, black and infinite. <sighs> So let's see, last year I realized I had enough short fiction to put together a manuscript. Mm -hmm. So I guess last spring I was started curating it, putting it all together, figuring out the order of things, the structure I wanted it to follow. And uh, which new pieces, you know, I wanted to put in there. And I think the, the last piece that I uh, that I finished was um, we've all gone to Crooked Town. Thanks for coming, Kat. Have a good night. Um, yeah, so the last piece I did was we've all gone to Crooked Town, which was originally titled Make a Wish, um, <laughs> which was an ex experimental prose poem, you know, format that I'd always wanted to try. And, uh, mm -hmm. so once that was done, uh, you know, I put it all together. Cemetery dance had just opened for, uh, you know, manuscripts at the time. So my agent at the time, uh, you know, shopped it to them, Kevin bought it and you know, the rest is history. Uh, so that's pretty much, I mean, there wasn't a lot of like, brooding over <laughs> you know over what to put in it what to leave out like i did for a minute consider splitting it in half and having two mm -hmm. collections oh uh do you have enough for another collection though not enough for another collection yet okay. um but uh <laughs> thanks <Kevin. laughs> um you know i've got I'm working my way toward it already. Uh, you know, it, it, it's a nice thing about short stories is that, you know, it doesn't require a huge time commitment and, mm -hmm. you know, you send them out into the world. If they get published, great. If they don't, they just go in a folder and sit for a time when, you know, it's, you know, it's time to collect them into something. So yeah, yeah. There, there wasn't a whole lot of uh, deliberation other than, you know, should I split this into two collections and just have like two releases instead of one? But I tried that with my first first collection uh, of mm -hmm. little things like that was originally going to be two volumes. And we decided to just do one book and focus all of our resources on one book. And ultimately, that's what, you know, decided it for me was, you know, it makes sense to do that. And I'd rather get it all out there and once it's done you know i don't have to worry about it i can go work on the book i was working on at the time yeah so and what's what's the um uh, go ahead jay I, I was gonna ask what's the time frame for these what's the oldest oldest story in this oh, or God. did you do everything together just last year hey bo um time frame I mean, these stories go back. I wrote in the in the afterward for the book that it kind of this collection kind of comprises the last five years of my writing career. Okay. Um, and I, I approached it as a, a greatest hits album of sorts. Uh, but the oldest story goes back to two thousand seven, two thousand eight. Oh wow. Uh, and that's the story Black Friday. Didn't get published <laughs> until 2014, I think it was, or 2015. 
Uh, I don't remember exactly when it was published, but that story originally wrote in the early aughts, mid aughts, late aughts, whatever. <laughs> I wrote it in the aughts, okay? In the aughts. <laughs> <laughs> so how, how many stories do you have in there that are, uh, are brand new, haven't been published before for this new one? Uh, so we've all gone to Crooked Town, The Happy Town, Yuletide Massacre, and Solve for X. Nice. Those... Those might be my three favorite. I like Solve for X a lot, and the Crooked Town one is really cool because that's that's what the cover is based on too. Yeah, yeah. the The cover is is based on We've All Gone to Crooked Town, which kind of like a prequel story to my the my story that ends the collection. We've all gone to the magic show. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> thanks, Laurel. Um, yeah. I, I, I didn't expect the cover to get as much reception as it did. Um, so I'm, cu- it, I'm, go go ahead. ahead. I don't want to cut you off. No, no, it's fine. Go ahead. I was going to say, did you write the story for the cover? No. Really? No, the cover came from, from the story after the fact. Like, I originally wanted Francois Valancourt to do the cover. Mm-hmm. Oh, thanks, Cindy. Thanks for coming. Um, I wanted Francois to do the cover, but timing did not work out. So Mm -hmm. he had already lined up a bunch of other contracts and I know he was having some health issues at the time. And, you know, I said to Kevin, like, you know, we need to get this book out there now, not, you know, three months from now and two months before release or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, I took a stab at it in Photoshop because I, I already had the idea for the cover. I just wanted to see what Francois would do with it. Mm. Yeah. Cause I love his style and I love his approach to art. And so I took a stab at it, you know, and I'm not a, I'm not a painter. I'm not an illustrator per se. You know, I'm, I'm just a designer, but I know my way around Photoshop a fair bit. So mm. I found some good stock photography that kind of matched what I had in my head and I just played with it from there. Got really high one night and just <laughs> focused on it. <laughs> and that's how the cover came to be. And I, I love it. I love it's probably my favorite piece that I've done. I love that's the way the cookie crumbles. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love the how how it looks like a painting. Um, it does, yeah. Even though it is not, it's just a photo manipulation. And uh, I even, I don't know if, Brad, I don't know if you noticed, but uh, I attributed the cover art to Jack Tremley. I did, yes. From <laughs> Devil's Creek. <laughs> that so, was cool. Yeah. He'll be my alter ego when it comes to like visual stuff from time to time. <laughs> I, I really so, love how, how the cover fits that specific story so well, too. Thank you. It's, it's, really, it's a really cool cover. I had when, somebody somebody uh, commented on the cover. They had I had happened to see the alternate text that they had entered on social media for the image, uh-huh. and they described it as a, a shadowy figure holding an umbrella. That's not an umbrella. <laughs> <laughs> That's just part of the landscape that happens to be a oh, the little white kind of dot yeah. above it. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's not an umbrella. But hey, good that's try. That's funny. He, he just. <laughs> It's too hot. And there's yeah. no rain. Yeah, he's just hanging out. <laughs> that's cool. I like the kid in the well and the giant hole. Yeah, that's cool. I like it like, a lot. I guess that's not the hole though. Is that the forest? Maybe. My original, maybe my original idea was to have like this grotesque, um, uh, this grotesque image of these figures kind of like all crawling over each other to get up Mm -hmm. the side of the cliff oh yeah but that's beyond my ability (laughs) so did you want the cover to be specifically drawn from one of the stories because sometimes yeah short story collections covers they'll just be kind of kind of random and not really have anything to do with the actual content this one's yeah pull from the story i wanted i wanted it to be this one just because of what the that story is about and Mm -hmm you know, the, it plays with the idea of creation and, you know, kind of becoming your own, 
your own God, creating your own mm-hmm. world. And that in a sense is exactly what writers are and artists in general. So I wanted something that kind of captured that, that desolation, that mm-hmm. the end of something, the start of something else, uh, and just the, the overall mood. I feel like the, the mood of that story kind of encompasses all the others. It kind of, I mean, obviously this is not a pun, but, you know, we were just talking about this. Everything kind of falls under that umbrella. <laughs> I think the cover fits for the title too, because it seems old, like, and just infinite and dark and, yeah it's what kind of this wasteland it fits the the title of the book too thank you so so sticking with that when when you were putting picking these stories for this holly was there a criteria you were looking for did you give yourself like a a theme or a connection that when you're picking the stories you want to end this or was it just hey i have these done let's go with these i have these done um (laughs) mostly and it just so happened to work out that there was a thematic element to groups of them mm-hmm. like the story's broken up into three sections cold black mm-hmm. and infinite uh so it, that was not by design it just worked out that way uh which usually is how that made you realize it's all all right <laughs> right <laughs> yeah i mean there's like there's some dark humor sprinkled throughout but you know there's also some pretty pretty awful stuff uh in yeah. terms of what happens not in terms of the quality <laughs> <laughs> uh you know there's some parts are more you know more extreme than others other parts will just leave you questioning existence that's most likely falls into the infinite part which is the most cosmic horror uh of the of the bunch yeah mm-hmm. So if you were to sort of break down the sections, you know, cold, black, and infinite, can you say like the cold section is based on this kind of theme? Maybe like, is there anything so, you put in the words for, you know, I, I don't know if you noticed, but the, the stories in cold and let me open up the TOC just to remind myself of all the stories that are in there because they all kind of blur together after a while. Um, yeah, Midnight in the Southland, 245 to New Zebico, Happy Town, Y2K, Black Friday. They, they all kind of involve the cold in some way. Like some of these take place in cold holiday months. You know, mm-hmm. uh, Black Friday is a, I mean, it's America's favorite shopping holiday. It's a mm-hmm. post Thanksgiving yep. story. It's Happy Town is a Christmas story. Uh, Y2K takes place on. Uh, well, in the aftermath of Y2K in uh, the year 2000, so January. Midnight in the Southland is cold for a different reason, and I don't want to give it away, but, um, you know, it, it, it fits. Uh, same goes for 245 to News Epico. I just want to give a shout out to Red. We'll go. Red! I'm pretty sure she's on her anniversary date, and she's in the chat. <laughs> Oh, so that's so nice of you to spend your anniversary with us, Fred. <laughs> happy anniversary, my friend. Yes, happy anniversary, Red. Uh, yeah, so like that kind of encompasses cold. Black is more like pitch black. It's getting dark, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, these stories are, you know, black humor. Um, oh, thanks, man. Uh, you know, they they get a little bit more bloody, a little bit more violent, and then we head into Infinite, which is the way I described it. I think this was Satal at Conquest. I could be wrong, but again, uh, <laughs> good luck with the tropical storm. Um, I can't recall exactly who I who I told this to. But basically, I looked at it as the course of an evening. So like you know cold it's sun's going down it's getting Mm -hmm. colder black is when we hit full dark and infinite is when it's just the vastness of the universe overhead you know the milky way and everything it's nothing but stars 
to make you feel insignificant. Yes, <laughs> small little speck. That's cool. I like that. I like the way you broke it up in here, and that the sections are based off the title of the book. I think that was really cool. Well, I I would also be remiss if I did not mention the Cold Black and Infinite itself is uh, a line of a a Nine Inch Nails song. Okay. Yeah, uh, Cold and Black and Infinite with nothing left to lose from the uh, the song. Um, Oh my god, I'm not a Nine Inch Nails fan if I can't think of this. <laughs> uh, branches and Bones. That's it. Also, I want to thank you for setting stuff in Kentucky. Because I love, the first story might be my favorite, Midnight in the South, just because it's set in Kentucky. Uh, you know, from based on reviewers' reactions, that seems to be the most popular one of the bunch. Uh, yeah. And it's also where I got the name for the, the overall mythos that I'm building that mm -hmm. started with uh didn't actually start with devil's creek it goes back farther than that um there's a story in my first collection called the harbinger which is takes place in west virginia but it's the first appearance of the the um stone idols that mm -hmm. appear in in devil's creek but uh yeah i mean kentucky ohio Tennessee, West Virginia, you know, they're basically it's it's not so much the Southland as it is Appalachia uh -huh. and the Val, you know, the, the Ohio Valley from the Appalachia. I mean, Appalachia runs all the way up up through here. I mean, it's part of the Poconos, um, which is only like an hour and a half from me. Uh, so I'm not far from home in a sense. Yeah. And uh the overall picture, which I absolutely will not spoil for you tonight, does figure into the Appalachian Mountains in some form or fashion. Mm -hmm. So, so the the Southland is that that's sort of your the Todd Kiesling verse then? Kind of, I call it the Southland mythos because uh, it all stems from me wanting to create something that's adjacent to the Lovecraftian mythos, but not on the coast of new england all the time yeah something a bit different <laughs> yeah something a little different something you know a new a different pantheon of cosmic horrors what all stories are have been set in the southland so far obviously mm. short story midnight in the southland devil's creek so in so there's think about this so there's the harbinger from ugly little things uh saving granny from the devil from ugly little things uh, Devil's Creek exists in the Southland universe. The Final Reconciliation, scan lines. In terms of the stuff in Coal Black and Infinite, we've got Midnight in the Southland. Uh, the Gods of Our Fathers. Um, yeah, I can see that for sure. Holes in the Fabric. And uh, the Story of Gethsemane. Okay. I'm calling that one part of the Southland for re for for reasons. For reasons. <laughs> for reasons. I think maybe one of the reasons I like Midnight in the Southland so much, and maybe others are too. It's it was like the nostalgia factor, the very X Files feel to it, which I was really digging. Yeah. So it, it's that story came came up in a weird way. Like I had, you know, I wasn't in a depressed state when I wrote it. I was just feeling very reflective and I had been listening to a lot of Art Bell. Uh, Art Bell, you know, was a radio host of Coast to Coast AM all through the 90s into the 20 teens. Um, oh, thanks, Holly. Uh, I do too. <laughs> um, so Art Bell passed away in like 2018, 2019. I don't remember exactly when, but, um, and the coast to coast AM is still a show, but back in the nineties and the, the, the early aughts, it was basically the show where all the weirdos and nutcases would call in and talk about <laughs> UFOs and weird shit that happened to them. Um, and, you know, we've all gone to Crooked Town as a little bit of a nod to to 
coast to coast as well because there was this guy that called in. I think his name was Mel. Mel would call in to Art's show from time to time and talk about this massive hole in his backyard that he just kept throwing. <laughs> he, could, he would throw stuff in. He was using it as a dump, but it never filled up. <laughs> it was just bottomless. And, and then uh, one that swallowed his house and Mel was gone forever. Well, it's just like <laughs> the, they could never get a, they could never pinpoint exactly where he lived <laughs> because it was all <laughs> bullshit. Um, but yeah, back to the Southland for a second. I mean, it, I was I had been listening to a lot of reruns of the show. Uh, we had Erica and I had just come back from Richmond. Actually, uh, we were staying with my friend Dave and his wife Sam, and uh, he had taken us to the vet, you know, the ferry. And yeah. I lived in Lexington for you know four years. Had no fucking idea there was a ferry between Lexington and Richmond. But it makes Clay's sense ferry. considering Clay's, Clay's ferry. ferry. Right? You drive yeah. over Clay's ferry. It yeah. never clicked because I wasn't a bright person. <laughs> um, so he took us over this, and I'm like, yeah, this is make a really good setting for a, you know, for a story. Right. I just mm-hmm. didn't know how, and it got me thinking about going on night drives when I was in college. Uh, before I met Erica, I had gone through a pretty bad breakup, and it was kind of having to find myself a little bit and felt felt a little bit lost at the time. Mm-hmm. So I would go on these drives late at night and just kind of explore the, the city and explore the, the surroundings. And uh, I married that up with the fairy idea. Kevin, who was not the editor for Cemetery Dance at the time, he was editing an anthology uh, for Cemetery Gates um, called Liminal Spaces. And he had invited me to submit to that. And so you get into the idea of the nighttime kind of being a liminal space. You get into the idea of the ferry crossing from one side to the other while you're in the middle. That's also a liminal space. And Mm -hmm. I, I've got a, I've got a, a, a love for liminality in fiction. Uh, I took, I took a class on liminality in in college uh, and it's, that's one of the things I retained from my college days. Um, Mm -hmm. One of the few things. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So I was able to kind of marry that all up and, you know, there's a, I don't name her, but there's a reference to a certain radio DJ from devil's Creek yeah uh in that and it all just kind of came together in this weird confluence and the story just came out of that it wasn't like i didn't plan for it it was just one of those things where i needed to write a story about liminality Mm -hmm. and southland is what i came up with and introduce framing it all with this fictional radio host that's based on art bell Gus Guthrie allowed me to kind of set the, set the mood and the rest was magic. Now this might be weird to categorize it like this, but um, for me, this one almost felt like cozy horror in a way, that specific story. I don't know. I could see that. It was, I don't know. It was very like, it's weird to say it was a comforting story. I don't know what what was about it, but maybe the nostalgia coming in with like the X-Files and, I like the the lonely traveler and all that stuff. Just I don't know, there's yeah. something comforting about it in a way. I don't know. That's maybe that's completely off base and weird to say, but well, no, no, it can. It's absolutely there. I mean, it made me a little uh, reminiscent of when yeah. I was younger. And I was first trying to break into radio because I mean that's why I probably probably like it the best of it, the whole collection because of the whole radio connection. Mm-hmm. But like I remember when I was breaking into radio, like I would some of these smaller towns that I had to go to. I'd spend hours at night in like AM and FM looking for a signal that I know is very weak. So it's coming from a long, far away, far away, you know, trying to catch somebody that's a, doing a weird show like that, you know? Yeah. And, and cause I, I didn't know what I was doing when I first broke into it. I was trying to find my voice and everything, but I was like, man, if I can get like one of these that's become syndicated, you know, and I'd still probably be doing it, but it was always fun trying to find that show that was kind of allowed you know, the, the listeners to be on the air with them and, and mm-hmm. just talk about 
weird things like that. So when I was reading that, I was like, this, this is pretty cool. This kind of hits home. Because I, I remember coming across Art Bell a couple of times in some of the small places I, I used to live. It was always a weak signal. I don't know why, but it was just you know, AM back then. So I, I'm, I'm definitely dating myself here. But uh, so my first uh, first time I ever heard of Art Bell was um, at the end of Tool's album, Lateralis. There is a track that is basically a heavily uh modified version of this guy who called in to art show in a panic claiming he was from area 51 and he was <laughs> talking about all the you know the weird shit and everything and like they're trying to trace him and what's crazy is that the satellite that was you know broadcasting arts radio feed actually went down during that conversation so that that made it that gave it this bit of legitimacy but it was later you know the guy who who staged it all he called in and you know confessed that it was all just it was all fake uh -huh. but so i heard that you know and i'm like what the fuck is this from so i looked is, is that after the is that after the silence part or for the uh, album at the, it's at the, to the last track uh okay. Yeah, it like because it, because I, well, yeah, there's like the last there's like almost two minutes of silence after one track and then another one picks up at the very end. So if I remember correctly, that particular album, but yeah, okay. I'll uh, just go back and check it out again. Yeah, it's the last track. Um so I I looked up Art Bell and this is still in the days of Napster. So you <laughs> could, you know, so I downloaded a bunch of his episodes and listened to him, and that was my introduction. So we're talking like back 2001, like before I started college. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that was my introduction to Art Bell. Are those shows and, still available somewhere? Just I guess on YouTube or something? Oh, uh, you can maybe? actually, I actually am, I follow, it's on Spotify as a playlist and it's like Art Bell uh, archives or something like that. Do okay, a search cool. on Spotify. I'm, I'm betting there's probably a station or two somewhere that's still like still overnight syndication stuff. Yeah. Well, from what I understand, Coast to Coast AM still exists. It's uh, hosted by George Nori now, and it's not as good. Mm -hmm. um, but they like you can subscribe to them and get access to Art Bell's archives. Yeah. So. Yeah. If you if you like all that weird shit, you got to look up Art Bell. It, there's just because there's there's really no shows, at least not that I'm aware of, that are like that anymore. I guess. Oh, it's, I mean, it's, it's, but it's changed so much. Like, a, and it's, it's like, there might be, but it's not the same because it's all yeah. it would probably be like a podcast or something. It's just not the same as as way it was back like in early it's, 2000s it's, and late 90s and stuff. It's TikTok streamers and creepy pasta. Yeah. Yeah. That's I mean, I, I know I got I got into it way too late. Like that's like if I would have got into radio ten or fifteen years earlier than what I did, I may still mm -hmm. be in it. I may have been grandfathered into one of those those you know old veterans that I'll tell you how radio was when I was a kid. We had to splice together <laughs> tape, and I'd be one of those people. But no, I got into it too late, and it was by then. By the time I got into it, it was being taken over by big companies. Clear Channel, Clear Channel <laughs> was buying up everybody. Uh, CBS was selling off all other places. So I, I lost, I don't know how many jobs I lost. I got tired of moving around. So, and then you, you would get to go to one of these small places. Like I, I worked in one in Parkersburg, West Virginia. Like uh, here I am in Ohio. I stayed on the Ohio side on the Ohio uh, side of the river. Cause I didn't want to live in West Virginia, but Parkersburg, <laughs> West Virginia. And it was like a little independent uh, company making no money because they couldn't compete with clear channel. So yeah, it was, it's, it, was so bad at one point but go ahead did, did y'all have any weird shows like that on yours or is it just music well we had an am station and that's actually okay. i i i want to say i don't i don't think we uh carried art bell but we had a couple of you know eyebrow raising kind of shows that were <laughs> on that am station that you know because nobody was live on it it was all syndicated shows from around the, the country for that so yeah but um, that that you know that's down in you know southern Ohio where I was living at the time, 
So there are some weird conspiracy theorist people around. And so, of course, the AM station was perfect for them. <laughs> so, yeah. That's the, I like, I don't believe in really any of those conspiracy theories, but they're so fun to listen to. There's exactly like they're, they're a guilty pleasure. Like, I, I, yeah, they're, they're all bullshit and some <laughs> of them are super far fetched. But I think what I, I, I enjoy the possibility. Yeah. You know, I, I enjoy kind of thinking, well, what if for a second? And, mm. you know, mm. but, that's me and i do that for a living now so you know yeah. what if it, it's fun to fall down that rabbit hole every yeah, day. Just, yeah yeah i mean it it's a, a guilty pleasure for me right up there with ghost hunting shows which are oh, so stupid. same for me man I love, <laughs> I, love, I love ghost adventures i don't believe a word they say but that's such a fucking cool show <laughs> i wouldn't say it's cool zach's it's kind just, of a douchebag but he is you know, i like aaron a lot aaron is cool I'm, I we, love the, been, the guy that they, they always make him go off on his own, sit in a room. <laughs> it, it, Aaron's, always, the, Aaron's, Aaron's a tall, bald guy. And that's who I'm Billy. talking about then. Yeah. Yes. It's like, all right, Aaron, we're going to send you off on your own and let he you stare at the at yourself. Like I haven't watched it for a while, but it was, it was always funny when they would like explain the equipment they were using and yeah, they made it like sound like it was they made it like it was so high thing. high tech and like you know this would do this it was like two walkie talkies with duct tape around it and all kinds <laughs> like, like it's a it's an xbox connect that you like <laughs> yeah. you know homebrew yeah. and this, something this would else. pick up this would pick up the temperature <laughs> in the voice that we can't hear only dogs can hear and you're like it's a radio shack walkie talkie held together with, you're holding in the nine volt battery with duct tape what <laughs> That's funny you say the connect because they really do use the connect. Yeah, yeah, I know. Because <laughs> they do it night vision, so you can see all the infrared dots all over the yeah. place. They're like, oh, watch something will walk in front of it. That's funny. And then they did that in one of the paranormal activity films, and after that, it wasn't cool. <laughs> oh yeah, I did get to meet the Ghost Adventures dudes at Scarefest one year, and Aaron he was really cool. Zach wasn't bad in person. Aaron was really cool in person, though. That was back when the other guy was still on there, though. I okay. think his name was Nick when it was the original. Yeah, players. before they had a falling out. Yeah. Were those so, yeah, the, the told... plumbers? No, that, no. you're thinking of... Uh, That's uh, taps, taps, I think. Yeah. Taps, okay, yeah. It, it was the same thing. You know you know what we do. We come in and we do this, and it was like... They were using the same like uh, editing program to listen for voices that I used to put together our audio stuff that I stole from a radio station. So what like anything special high tech has always got a kick out of it. Like I totally don't believe any of that, but I don't know. It's fun to watch. I don't know why. Yeah. My wife and I used to, every Saturday night we'd watch ghost adventures and whatever the new episodes would come out back in the day, back before we had kids. We did too. And uh, one more thing about ghost adventures before we, you know, move on. Um, <laughs> It's probably one of my, my favorite uh, favorite things. This actually was one of those shows talking about Ghost Adventures. It was like Talk Soup or something that was on back in the day. I don't remember. Uh -huh. But basically, they focused on this one episode of Ghost Adventures where they went to Romania to yeah, investigate they, like something. Castle or something, I think. And they came across this, this pond and there was a dead uh there was a dead pig in the pond floating and there was a frog sitting on top of it and this um this talk show guy this host referred to it as a, a muppet murder suicide <laughs> 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 and that's always stayed with me that's what, uh, <laughs> so it really has nothing to do with ghost adventures nothing it's just, to do. just ghost adventures was the catalyst sorry i had, well, it, had that, it had to be talk soup then right it had to be it, i'm pretty sure it was talk soup or it was like yeah. daniel tosh or somebody i don't know that's funny so do you believe in ghosts at all even though you do i the show yeah do you know you think the shows are crap do you believe in ghosts at all I haven't made up my mind. I think it's more likely that what we experience as ghosts is actually more along the lines of, you know, quantum theory mm -hmm. and one reality bleeding into the another. Yeah. So like, you know, I have I'm not even going to pretend to know what happens when we die, but mm -hmm. I would like to think that 
we basically step out of this universe into another one. Okay. Uh, you know, I know that sounds kind of hokey, but it's no more hokey than we go to heaven or hell. Yeah. Or reincarnation or, you know, anything like that. Yeah. It's kind of like a, we move laterally into the next, you know, basically like moving laterally into a different reality where we're still ourselves. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, I, I find that plausible, but I'm also a weirdo. So who knows? <laughs> but yeah, it's the, the only thing that's the only thing to me scientifically that would make sense to explain ghosts. Mm -hmm. uh, so I usually err on the side of science. I think reincarnation would suck if you came back as another person and just had to start all over, just like thinking of going through school again and everything like that. Yeah, that it's horrible. like. <laughs> It's like starting New Game Plus in a game and not having any of your, you know, you don't even get to remember <laughs> yeah, what happened. Your prior experiences with you, you just got to start blank slate. That would be horrible. Yeah, it's like you might for a while as you're a child, but by the time you grow up and be able to act on that experience, you, you've forgotten it all. Yeah, it's just like you're like a, just a couple days old, you're an infant, and you still remember everything from your past life, but you can't vocalize it, and then it all fades away. It'd be terrible. Yeah. You just kind of, you basically just are this adult brain trapped in the body of a infant mm -hmm. that can't speak or, you know, have any authority to say anything that, you know, to do anything that matters. And I'll segue that into one of your stories. I'll yes. say, well, since we got so deep. Let's... Which one is it? Let me, let me think of the name. It's the one you read down in Berea with Karen. Oh, so, yeah. Uh, Afterbirth. After birth, yes. <laughs> I think, so I think, let me, I think that let was me, probably your funniest one. And I think it made it as even funnier because you named the woman Karen. I, just, I don't know why. Necromancy <laughs> isn't for everyone, Karen. That's right. Uh, yeah, that story was a fun one to write. I forget what the Republicans had done to piss me off that day. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I remember I was having coffee with Summer Cannon. And I was telling her like this idea that I had and she's like, you have to write that. So <laughs> I went home and I wrote, I wrote most of it in a day and cause I was angry. I usually write, <laughs> write pretty fast and sharp when I'm angry. Uh, -huh. uh so That's yeah, a that was story one, too. That's dark. Th thank you. Thank you. Um, I wrote that for the first and only issue of Weird Whispers that was put out by Nightscape Press back in 2020, 2019. I don't remember exactly when. Uh, it was originally published under the title Pro-Life. So <laughs> I changed that, obviously, um, yeah. to something a little bit less politically charged. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, yeah, that's one of my favorites too, and it's always like for the for the folks who weren't there uh, at my signing in Berea. <laughs> like, Laurel read a short story from her new collection. Every woman knows this, which if you don't have it, you need to buy that right now. Mm -hmm. um, and I read the story after birth, but before I did, I gave the audience a choice. I said, "Do you guys want something funny?" Or do you want something gross? gross. <laughs> and everybody wanted gross, except for this one lady who wanted funny. <laughs> so I apologized to her before we started. And then I read uh, the story after birth. The owner of the store got up and walked out of the room. It was pretty awesome. <laughs> the best part was your mom's reaction. She yeah, just, so my mom... So disappointed. <laughs> my mom was sitting there in front of me my mom came to the show and she's sitting there and every, from time to time i would just look down from the book and just look right at her <laughs> almost like i was reading the story to her because she never yeah. read that one before and uh so that was a lot of fun for me i don't know if other people enjoyed it but <laughs> i had a blast I thought that was great. And your mom's reaction was just killing me. She was just shaking her head and she was trying so hard not to just laugh. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, for a preview for the folks who, you know, haven't read the story before or heard me read it publicly. Um, 
the story is about a disturbed woman who wants a child so badly that she be, turns to necromancy to grow her own child from the amniotic waste she's stealing from an abortion clinic. Mm -hmm. Jay, you shaking your head. That's just exactly what Todd's mom was doing. She and <laughs> this, but the story is told from the perspective of the entity in the bucket that she summoned. Yeah. Is this the one you're reading for us tonight? No, no, I'm not okay. reading that one. <laughs> Well, I'll plug, if you go watch my vlog, The Summer of Dread Vlog, I have a snippet of the beginning of that story in there and read it from the, the book event. Yeah. So, Speaking, do you want to go ahead and do your reading? Do yeah, reading? yeah, we can do that. So, uh, there was some deliberation tonight as to what I was going to read. Um, didn't want to read Afterbirth because I've already read it publicly. I don't want, I would love to read Midnight in the Southland, but I'm not going to because that episode of Pseudopod is coming soon. And yeah, you can listen to the full audio on Pseudopod and I can't wait to hear what they've come up with. <clears throat> so tonight I'm going to read a few scenes from the beginning of my story. Annie's heart is a haunted house, which first appeared in the hideous book of hidden horrors uh published by bad hand books and edited by doug morano so this one's for doug who may or may not be watching uh thanks for buying my story and taking a chance on it man <clears throat> annie's heart is a haunted house sheila was the next to go before her Tobias and Jenny. Now there was only Rich and me, standing in the foyer and staring at the shredded remains of our fellow inmate, half a torso and one leg. Some of her insides were scattered across the floor, and the whole foyer was a skating rink coated in her blood. There was no mistaking it. The housemaster had been here, and it had treated Sheila like a grisly pinata. We were only gone for a couple of minutes. Rich turned to me, his cheeks slick with tears, and held out his hands in defeat. I stood at his side and looked at the dead girl. She'd survived longer than I expected. How many days had it been now? Sheila was the one who kept count, scratching a thin line in the upstairs hallway for every sleep cycle. With the windows bricked up, we had no idea if time even existed here. But it kept Sheila busy, gave her a purpose. She was going to be my girlfriend, Rich said, and dropped a fire iron at his side. We just, last night, he turned to the stairs in the direction of our sleeping host. You crazy bitch! His knees buckled, and I watched him sink to the floor in despair. I reached out to comfort him, but thought better of it. There's no point now. We made a rule in the beginning. Never go anywhere alone. It was a rule we learned the hard way. Rich had wandered away from us in search of a bathroom while we bickered amongst ourselves, confused, disoriented, scared. This doesn't make sense, man. Tobias tugged on the chains barring the entry doors. Four chains, the heavy-duty kind with thick links and bound by multiple locks. Defeated, he paced the foyer and mumbled to himself, I went to bed. In my bed, how the fuck did I end up here? How did any of us? Sheila was a crying mess. Jenny held her, tried comforting her friend, but it was no use. She was equally frightened, and for good reason. We'd each gone to sleep on our own beds and homes scattered across town and had woken up together in this massive house, a mansion by the look of it. Everything was ornate and immaculate, not a speck of dust or sign of clutter with dual chandeliers above and a large fountain at the far end, mounted animal heads above the doorway, one moose and a boar on either side, red walls, white crown molding, polished hardwood floors. It was something right out of a magazine, picture perfect and untouched, someone's idea of bourgeois living. 
and then we heard Rich screaming for help. We found him at the end of a long hallway. He clung to the edge of a hole in the floor, dangling above a hazy red void. Tobias took hold of Rich's hand and pulled him to safety. How'd you miss a giant hole in the floor, dumbass? No, Rich whimpered. It wasn't like that. I was walking and the floor just gave out beneath me. A square flap of flooring unfolded it by itself and sealed the hole. The trapdoor's outline was barely visible in the glow of gaslights adorning the hallway walls. No wonder Rich hadn't seen it. Sheila found her voice between sobs and asked, What is this place? Shh, it's okay. Jenny looked to me and then to Rich. Her face slowly drained of color as realization took hold. It could have been any one of us. Are we going to die here, Jen? She put her arm around Sheila, gave her a squeeze. Shh, no, Sheila, no. Right, guys? Silence slipped between us. We were all thinking the same thing and were too afraid to say it. Three days passed before we saw the house master for the first time. We were tired, strung out, panicking because we hadn't felt hunger or the need to relieve ourselves. Everything had stopped. We were trapped in a prison of better homes and gardens. And at first it seemed like everything was over, that the world had come to an end. God, we were so wrong. And I only wish we had remained ignorant. But then, that's the nature of our punishment, isn't it? I don't have time for this reality TV bullshit! Tobias raged to no one, screaming until his voice fried and he exhausted himself. He looked to me and Rich, and then to the girls. I, I can't be here. I I've got a game tomorrow. Or was that yesterday? He collapsed on the floor, chest heaving, chin quivering. I saw a tear slip from his eye. Tobias's forlorn proclamation echoed our quiet sentiment. We were 17 in our last year of high school. We had final exams and games and parties. Well, most of us. The others were so popular. At the top of our social pyramid, Tobias was a linebacker for the football team and had a full university scholarship waiting for him in the fall. Jenny ran track and was the president of both the National Honor Society and the Drama Club. Sheila was the homecoming queen and captain of the dance team. Rich was the class president and an active member of the future business leaders of America. And then at the very bottom, there was me. I was the odd man out of our imprisoned group, an art nerd, president of the National Art Honor Society. I was too. Spent most of my spare time in the art room, no scholarship, no real friends and no place among my peers. Even I didn't understand my presence in this place. Please stop yelling, Sheila said. It was the first thing she'd spoke in more than a day. It isn't getting us anywhere. She paused, shook her head in disappointment. We all had things going on this weekend. Tobias snorted. <laughs> Whatever, Sheila. Nothing important, I'm sure. Fuck you, Tobias. Guys, please don't fight. Rich shot a look to me for support, but I shrugged in reply. What could I say that would make them calm down or even listen? He scoffed, annoyed by my silence, and raised his voice. Seriously, stop the arguing. It isn't getting us anywhere. You want to come over here and make me, tough guy? Tobias shot to his feet, popped his neck, and glared. Rich shrank back, played off his panic with a shrug like the 220-pound brick of muscle wasn't worth his time. Yeah, Tobias said, grinning. That's what I thought. And then to the girls, I don't see you two doing anything about getting us out of here. All I see is you whining about your fucking football game. Jenny had finally had enough. Who gives a shit, Tobias? You whine about homework. You whine about Sheila not giving you the time of day. All you do is whine. Why don't you actually do something about it instead of crying like a little bitch? I really thought he would hit her. He opened his mouth, closed it, shook his head. Nah, he said. Fuck this and fuck all y'all too. 
He left us and took the stairs two at a time, his heavy footfalls rattling the whole house. Rich implored him to wait, but Tobias had set his peace, and there was no stopping that freight train. We looked at one another, listening to the guy's footsteps upstairs, and held our breath when the pounding started. Tobias kicked in every door he found in the upstairs hallway. He'd already worked his way to the far end by the time we reached the second floor. Tobias stared at us, the trunk of his torso heaving with deep breaths and his face bright red. He had a runner's stance, was about to charge straight for us. Rich gasped. Jenny and Sheila held hands, shaking. Me. I readied myself for the impact. The jagged end of a broken wooden beam exploded from the ceiling and pierced Tobias' stomach. He gasped in shock, tried to scream, but all he managed was a slow, mewling groan. Another piece of wood, this one finally sharpened into a stake, shot from above and impaled him through his chest, pinning him in place. The others cried out in terror, but I was too shocked to make a sound. Instead, I could only stare and try to make sense of what I was seeing. The two wooden pieces were still attached to the ceiling, protruding from a cracked hole directly above Tobias, and I thought he'd fallen into another one of the traps. Pieces of plaster and crown molding broke away from the walls and merged together. Wires snaked through the cracks and wound their way around the two jutting timbers. Tobias was long dead at this point, a merciful end in retrospect. He never had, the, had to experience the truth of what killed him. We forgot our places in the social scheme and huddled together in fear. We whimpered as the housemaster assembled itself. We watched. Bits of drywall coated the floor and filled the air with dust. The gas lamps along the hallway formed eerie halos in the cloud, silhouetting a thing composed from pieces of the house. The creature's body was the size of a refrigerator and its multiple arms of wood and rebar scraped the walls and creaked as they bent at the joints. It descended, examined its prey, and lifted Tobias's limp corpse. A makeshift door swung open from its chest, and in went the remains of our school's star linebacker. Satisfied with the kill, the housemaster walked to the nearby wall and merged with the structure. The whole upper level trembled with the creature's force. And within seconds, it was gone. A beat later, Rich said, What the fuck was that? And if you want to find out what the fuck that was, you got to buy Cold Black and Infinite. Such Alpha language. Your day <laughs> from Cemetery Dance. Nice. That's a good spot to leave off. Yeah. Such language, Todd. Come I on. Know, right? <laughs> Jay was just cringing the whole time. Oh, had oh I didn't cringe. Words. I was just la <laughs> laughing every time. It was my favorite part. Fuck you, Tobias. <laughs> that's what I'm just going to go around saying that. People Fuck you, Tobias. <laughs> Becky oh, that said that's one of her faves. Thank you, Becky. Thanks, author fan. <laughs> so, do you have a favorite story in here? Or is that too hard to pick? Like picking your favorite kids or something? <sighs> that's a Sophie's choice. Um... <laughs> You know, it, Bo, Bo, you're one to talk about language. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> yeah, really. Uh, favorites. I mean, they're all favorites for different reasons. Like Midnight yeah. in the Southland is a favorite just because I feel like that's that's the one story everyone seems to agree on. Mm -hmm. So like I, I had a perfect balance there uh, of everything. Um, We've all gone to the magic show is one of my favorites because that was my first sale at professional rates. Thank you, John Paget, and the the newly uh, canceled Vastarian magazine, which is unfortunate. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like they're they're all my children. <laughs> <laughs> so all this is my a weird question. Sure. Do you have do you have one that pisses you off the most? For me, it was uh, Tommy and the, what is it? Tommy the Destructo bot versus the bullies from Future Street. I was, with the scene in the bathroom, I was like, if that was my kid, I would have, I would be in jail. I would have murdered that bully. <laughs> it would have been over. Yeah. 
Uh, what pisses me? You off said the one the you wrote uh, after birth. You said you wrote that one because was I was pissed off when I wrote it, but the story really doesn't <laughs> piss me off. It makes me laugh now. Um, Black Friday was hard. Black Friday, uh, okay. Did Black you work Friday. Retail? What's that? Did you ever work retail? Oh yeah, okay. I wrote that about a. I wrote Black Friday about a year after I quit. Correction, two years after I quit working my last retail job. And that was uh, Staples mm -hmm. at Staples. I was the copy center guy who made all your copies. And <laughs> oh, they needed me there well. on Christmas Eve for some yeah. ungodly fucking reason. So you're what? You're, I think his name was Thomas. You're the guy that knows to shoot him in the head. The zombie. Uh, <laughs> that, well, <laughs> actually, no. That was uh, based on a friend of mine at the time, Thomas. Uh, okay. It was kind of like a a nod to several friends like uh my old manager matt uh i, I sent the story to him i sent the story to a few of my co-workers after i wrote it because it was kind of like a i wrote it before christmas so i wanted it to like send them it to them as a gift because i was poor and couldn't afford to buy any real <laughs> gifts and just the there was a draft of it and the thing is, it was too long. It's a novelette. So it was mm -hmm. too long to get it to send it anywhere. And I tried shortening it at one point in time for a George Romero themed anthology because it's my only zombie story. Uh -huh. And I hit my head against the wall with it because I couldn't I couldn't find a good way to shrink the story down and still have it be as impactful. And so I, I bet I've revised that story seven or eight times. Really? Um, and when I finally fixed it, uh, completely changed the like the structure would bounce around, like it would bounce bounce around in time time frame. And that was part of the issue. I, I decided to just you know get get over myself and just put it in a chronological order. Mm -hmm. And. I fixed it. Nice. And uh, it was one of those examples of me needing to get out of my own way. Mm -hmm. And but yeah, it it pissed me off a lot just in trying to make it work. And uh, you know, I get it got published. It was it was in one of the Bethlehem books for charity, uh, and they ended up that particular edition it's they started the book with black friday oh cool uh it's like oh unholy night in Bethlehem, i think <laughs> uh i forget what charity that benefits but they do one every year uh and it was it was so long that i knew the odds of me actually getting paid for that one were pretty slim mm -hmm. so yeah, it appeared there first, and I did I did it as a standalone chat book a couple of years ago through Godless. Okay. And uh, yeah, that one pissed me off. Um, <laughs> you think? I mean, they've all pissed me off in some way or another. <laughs> I'm hitting my head against the wall. Uh, Tommy actually was one that I struggled with. Uh, it took yeah. me like six or seven years to write that story. Really? Uh, I, originally, I wrote it. So Mercedes Yardley and I basically promised to each other that we were going to write the other into a story. And in mm -hmm. her story, she which she wrote in like two days and got <laughs> it published and everything because that's what she does. Uh, my character is dead at the beginning of the story. <laughs> and his name is Todd. So I wanted to write something that kind of captured her dark, whimsical persona. And that took form in the in the shape of Mercedes Future, the mad scientist at the end of the block. But you know, I struggled with the beginning of that story for years. I would go back to it every so often and it just didn't feel right. Didn't, you know, something about it would piss me off and I'd put it away and work on something else, which is usually how a lot of my short fiction happens. Uh, if it's not written 
for someone like I've got five stories in various states of progress right now from going back several years because I couldn't find the right thread or, or I haven't found the right thread yet or, you know, I just got sidetracked or I wrote part of it and then felt lukewarm about it. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I always have a handful of those in my back pocket. I'll probably try to dust one of them off and revise for another open call before the end of this year. Um, but yeah, I I'm curious. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead finish your thought. I'm sorry. I'm like, but yeah, I mean, they they've all. I hit my head against the wall at some point with everything I write, and what gets published is, you know, usually the result of hitting my head very, you know, very many times. <laughs> <laughs> I want to ask what those ones that you, you know, you start, you said that one took you forever to write a couple of years as authors, you know, your voice changes or, mm-hmm. you know, you you grow as an author. So when you go back and work on something like say now that you started five years ago, do you feel a difference in you know what you're adding to the story now as opposed to what you wrote back then? Then you have to change the whole thing to sort of fit your voice now. Uh, that makes sense what I'm trying to ask? Yeah, yeah, it does. I and, mean, you know, it, it absolutely, your voice changes, you know, your word usage changes, you know, you, you start something. I mean, let's use Devil's Creek as an example. You know, I started mm-hmm. writing and taking notes about Devil's Creek in 2007. And I tried to write it then, and it was just a jumble of different scenes. I didn't know where they all fit in the scheme of things. So I put it away for about seven years. Really? Yeah. And uh, I picked it up in 2014 and played around with it some more. And, you know, I had lost a couple of the scenes. Mm -hmm. Like I still had the notes, but I I lost in a hard drive crash uh, some of the, the, the working document that I had, which was fine. Um, but then, you know, I wrote like the opening scene with, uh, all the grandparents driving into the woods, you know, that's Mm -hmm. from 2014. Um, the scene with Riley and, uh, his youth group and in the woods camping, that's from 2014. And again, I ran into the same problem. I couldn't figure out where I wanted everything, how to tell the story and what order to tell the story. So I set it aside again until 20, 2016, 2017. I forget exactly when I picked it up. 2017, mm-hmm. I think. And, you know, everything that I had written, you know, I went back and revised. Okay. Because, you know, you grow. It's only natural. Your voice is going to change. Uh, your word usage is going to change because you're always growing. You have more experience to draw from. And I feel like that one's experience is really, or at least in my, you know, speaking personally, my experience in life and talking to people and reading and just being part of the world around, Uh around me, uh, informs the way I talk, informs the, you know, what words I use on the page. Mm -hmm. So it's absolutely something old absolutely is going to get revised when it comes to my process, because who I was when I started it doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. And all that's really good, all that's really good for going back to old stuff is having, you know, the bones of a story to kind of flesh Mm -hmm. out and uh you know and then it's almost like the idea too yeah it's the kernel of the idea but it's also the the concept of the story is there the general direction i want the story to go in but maybe maybe i wasn't you know in the right frame of mind to write that story yet so it had to it had to percolate a little bit. Hey Chad. Oh, Brad is typing. Sorry. 
<laughs> hey, Christina, I didn't see you slip in there. So I also want to mention the, so you did the, I'm assuming you did, all the interior design and everything for, yeah. for this one, the new one. Yeah. Yeah, after Devil's Creek, I was asked to keep things minimal. <laughs> <laughs> I will say, that's putting it lightly, right? I, lo I love this page. Oh, that thank page you. Is, that's such a cool page. That yeah, was, uh, yeah. that's from We've All Gone to Crooked Town. That's my. I'll show uh, Devil's Creek. I don't know if it'll come through, but like the corruption gets more and more. As it, you gets dark, it gets darker and darker and darker. So uh, for the, the for the, the black section, for the black yeah. section of this, you should have had all black pages with white lettering. So here's the thing. <laughs> I, I would love to do that. But the main printers, the commercial printers that everyone oh, uses, Ingram and well, Amazon doesn't give a fuck. They'll print whenever you get them. Ingram, however, is very particular, and if your pages are too dark, they upcharge you on the paper stock. And I found that out with Hideous Book of Hidden Horrors because we really uh, experimented with the you know white text on a black background. Yeah. The problem is is that they're not using black paper; they're printing on white paper, so they're using like all this toner. To print. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Just, so that that's where the cloud ink they're using. Yeah. So yeah. the pages would stick together, and it was uh, their, their their process. Right. Right. There was so, a book I read recently, and every now and then it have solid black pages. You could tell it was ink because they were kind of curled over a little bit. Yeah. So you need like a specialty press that's going to print it on black stock. Right, and who knows how much that would fucking cost? <laughs> ridiculous. That would but be yeah, ridiculous I would totally. It, I would totally in if I could go back and do it, and I wasn't restricted to the kind of design I could do. I would totally just have it fade and get darker and darker, where it's like white text on you know black background. That'd be that'd be sweet. Are you still here, Kevin? <laughs> <laughs> the the look special edition, you know? Yeah. One day. Maybe one day. Only 10 copies, $500 each. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, they'd have to be, probably. Yeah. Do that with like Thunderstorm books or something. They'd probably do something like that. Be like a $2 profit. <laughs> yeah. So do you enjoy doing the, the design aspect of a book? Not just writing a book, but designing what it yeah, like? Yeah, it's, it allows me to stretch a you know, different part of my brain, put it to work. Mm -hmm. uh, I tend to to dive into visual stuff when mm -hmm. the well is dry for writing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, that's also, you know, how I pay the bills these days. I, I do design work for uh, other authors and publishers. And, um, you know, it's, it's a nice, it's nice to be able to have something else to pivot to that's still creative. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it, I mean, I think Becky Spratford uh, in her, she reviewed Call Black and Infinite for book list. And she mentioned about how my, my experience as a designer shows in the, my language choices. And uh, thank you, Holly. Thank you. Um, how that having a visual background informs that and makes a, a bit more of a visual experience when you're reading my work and that's mm -hmm. she really hit the the nail on the head there because that that's always been one of my goals as a writer uh because i was destined for a, a career in graphic design and or possibly film uh before i ever thought about being a novelist and that all changed when my senior year of high school, I turned a, a screenplay that I'd written with like no budget. Uh, <laughs> I turned that into a novel. Okay. And that kind of changed my, my trajectory because I, I took that novel with me to, to college. It guidance counselors said I should submit it to this award that they have. It took second place. I got paid for the first time ever for any of my writing. And, uh, that I declared an English major and everything else is history. But, you know, my interest in art and film never went away. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I tried to think about, 
I try to think about how I'm going to portray something on the page so that I can give you the same image in your head that I see in mine. Mm -hmm. uh, if I can manage to do that and it's vivid, then I've done my job. Uh, doesn't always work out that way. Sometimes it's, you know, I fall short, but that's part of growth. That's part of, you know, you keep going and keep trying. To go along with that, I also think you, you do a good job, though, of not over detailing things where, you know, you are just driving home that one picture. You still, you do a great job of allowing the, the reader to also make up the image too without you're not just you know every every single thing about something you're not saying it's this this and this and yeah there's this definitely and this there's like a fine line there there's Being definitely descriptive or yeah it's, it's a tightrope walk you know you have mm -hmm. to balance it and you know so if you see me describing something in detail it's for a reason you know mm -hmm. otherwise you know i'm i'm a pretty lazy person and if i can give <laughs> the reader just enough so that they can formulate in their mind what the character actually looks like and that's yeah. stuff that's words i can use for something else you yeah. know you, you, i try to be economical in that regard it doesn't always work out that way i know some people criticize devil's creek because it said it was overwritten um for that reason uh but i don't give a fuck i wrote the book i wanted to write <laughs> uh but you know i try to i try to present enough to give the, the reader a suggestion of what they should be seeing. Right. Yeah. Sometimes I want them to really focus in on it. Other times I just need it to be, you know, set dressing. It's there, mm -hmm. you know, you know, it's there. So, you know, it's, it's night, it's day, it's hot, it's cold. Um, and over time, like starting out, it was, I had to be conscious of, you know, doing that. And now it's kind of become just instinctual. You do it enough. So, yeah. yeah. Cold, black, and infinite. It's, yes, sir. Uh, what, Tuesday, right? Tuesday. Tuesday. Is that what we're saying? Tuesday. From Cemetery it, Dance. Um, so it's it available in paperback. It's available in this beautiful case-wrapped hardcover. Are you doing some signed ones through your website? or? Uh, so I took a pre-order for one week for signed copies. So that pre-order window has closed. Okay. Um, I may in the future, probably this uh, holiday season. Um, I've got okay, cool. I've got two more events lined up after this for, well, end of October and early November. And then I'm done traveling for the year. I'll be home. <laughs> So I'll probably put whatever, you know, I'll probably order a small stock of books. Uh, so best advice I have there is just to keep uh, subscribed to my newsletter. If you haven't already, uh, keep an eye on my socials. Yeah. And keep and, stalking, looking in your window. Uh, yeah. You know. And that's yeah. fine. <laughs> Todd's been great. Thanks so much for uh Agreeing to hang out with us and talk about your stuff, talk about your book. Um, it should be Thank on everyone's you. list. If they haven't pre-ordered it yet, I mean, they can pick it up. It's a great Christmas cool. gift, guys. 16 Todd Kiesling stories. You can't go wrong with that. Yeah. And it's got a couple of uh, holiday-themed stories in it, so it's perfect yeah, for the I season. Think, yeah. so you might even pass. say it's the reason for the season. For the season. Oh. <laughs> Oh yeah, it does. Oh. It's got thanks. It's got Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving-ish story. Black yeah, Friday it's story, got a Christmas story. It's got a um, you know, a what's the word I'm looking for? It's got a. It's gone. Easter. <laughs> it's got an Easter story in it. We'll put it that there way. Go. There you go. See, it runs the game. It's got all the. It's all yeah. Got all the holidays in there. So if if you have a. Uh, uh, 10 year old niece that is the the daughter of that relative you don't want to you know talk to anymore this is Definitely the book get her this yeah, that yeah. Seems it, won't, it, won't, it won't scar anybody it won't scar her at all <laughs> but it will probably make her parents not talk to you anymore so if that's your goal <laughs> go jay i feel like this is coming from a personal place would you like to talk about it oh uh, that's a whole other show okay all right Todd. thanks we, we appreciate you stopping by really um, thank you thank you, you for know, having me guys for uh, chatting it. about it and, and everyone in the chat thanks so much for uh, hanging out with us this evening cold black and infinite
the latest from Todd Kiesling. Kiesling, designed by Todd Kiesling, yes, produced by Todd Kiesling. <laughs> <laughs> it's all Todd yeah. Kiesling, guys. Story and, of my life. Yeah. And, and that's Gates. it. Check it out. All right, guys. Thanks again. Thanks everybody. Todd, yeah. Thanks for hanging out, Jay. I love you, Jay. I know you do. Fuck you, Tobias. <laughs> Fuck you, Tobias. <laughs> <laughs>